Hey, hello, hi, welcome to, and we're back to the Equitheory Podcast. I am your host, Jill Therese, and on this week's episode, I've got some mental healthy awareness type things that I want to talk about. So let's jump into it. Alrighty, guys. So uh, I I have a lot on my mind, but I also have a lot in my face. So please bear with me. I am being hit with the allergy train for real this week. Like I am snotty and coffee and my face is stuffed like ridiculous. So bear with me uh, if I sound a little bit different than normal or if I have to move away from the mic and cough my lungs out, uh, I will be doing that. So anyway, yeah, today's episode, uh, I honestly, I don't have a plan for. I'm going to be straight up with you guys. Uh, I, I've been sitting here with my headphones on, with all of my rig set up, and I'm like, what on earth am I going to talk about? First of all, I wanted to move the podcast back to Tuesdays because that way I feel like I have a full week to get it together because my internet is so unreliable. It's so hard to get the episodes up and out. And like just the little things like making the thumbnail, if I can't edit it because my internet's out and I use Canva, little editor guy, um, then I I, I can't make it happen. So um, that way I'll have a full week to be a little bit more prepped and prepared, which unfortunately means this week is crunch time. <laughs> um, because rather than skipping an episode to change the date, I'd rather get one up and then be set up for next week. So that is what we're doing. And, uh, this week is going to be chaotic. That's what that means. But with that said, let me take a breath here. With that said, I am done with my spring semester. I just finished the last assignment that I had due yesterday. And so no more school until I have this little course I have to take in May. Um, If you don't know, getting my master's in clinical mental health counseling. For those of you who are regular listeners of the podcast, you're like, we get it. You're in a master's program. You're proud. Uh, I am. Okay. It's not easy. It's not easy being me. But yeah, so uh, I'm wrapped up with school for the moment. And so I can delve a little bit deeper into the podcast. I am still just being so nitpicky with my website and merch and stuff. So that's not fully ready yet. But um, yeah, for a second, I thought I was going to change website host and like redo my whole website. And I was like, Jill, just stop. Um, Still might change my podcast host because um, I preferred making money when I was doing the podcast. It felt a little bit better. Um, so we might we might switch on back over to Anchor. So if you start hearing those Spotify Anchor ads, then that's what happened. So just giving you a heads up, my lovelies, that will that will be a potential. But with that housekeeping aside, I like I said, I haven't been feeling so hot physically this week, and I kind of just wanted to talk about some mental health type beat <laughs> around horsemanship because it's been super rainy and gloomy here. And I feel like in the past, I probably would have been a little bit more on the down, unmotivated side. Sorry about that. And like now, I'm not really feeling that so much as much as I'm just like content to not. Um, And like, I know I've talked about it before uh, recently, but that was a big part of why it was so hard to come back to the podcast is because I'm like not doing a ton of horse stuff right now. Um, the trailer loading thing was great. I could make an episode about that. I could talk about it all day long, but when it's not like presently happening, it's kind of hard to like, I want to rehash the basics and like talk about things that have happened in the past. And if you guys have seen me do anything that you'd like me to talk about, feel free to shoot me a message and I'll get on it. But, um, yeah, it's, like lately my focus has been more and you guys probably noticed this from the last episode but my focus has been on more mental health stuff because that's what I'm studying in school and that's where I'm dedicating a lot of my time and energy so um you know the podcast is called Equitheory and while it's a horse-based podcast I think that the human element is 
is the one listening to this podcast, you know. So I do think it's worthwhile to talk about mental health and the human side of it and how that applies to horses. So maybe that's something we can start integrating into this podcast because I am studying it. So hopefully I know what I'm talking about, at least to some degree. I am still learning and finding my way in all of it, but there's so much that I've learned that I'm just like, oh, that would have helped a lot in competition and stuff. But yeah, so it it's hmm, where to begin. I, I, like I talked a lot last episode about the energy that you bring into your training. And even just when you go out in the field to get your horse or to be with your horse. And I think the one of the things that I mentioned was like leaving it at the door or whatever. And, you know, I don't know that that's necessarily the best approach because I think, I think if you, if you approach going into training by being like, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to leave all my problems, all my worries. I'm going to leave today in my car when I pull up to the barn, or I'm going to leave it at home. I'm going to leave it at work. I'm going to leave it at school. Then on to some degree, you are then denying yourself the, the processing and feeling those things things and emotions and acknowledging that you're feeling them and that you're dealing with those real things, you know? And so I think that a, perhaps a different way of looking at it that might be more beneficial is like, instead of being like, okay, get it out of my head, get it out of my head. And then the the reason that I think that that's a problem, I'll come back to that. (laughs) The reason I think it's a problem to be like, I'll just leave it there is because not only are you denying yourself having those feelings and the opportunity to process and be with them and be aware of them, acknowledge them is also if you fail in that, you know, fail, um, then you are kind of setting yourself up for, you know, some guilt, shame, self-punishment when you're working with your horse. So if you aren't able to leave, say, that fight you had with your partner or how your best friend, you know, was late when she said she'd be on time or whatever, um, you know, things like that. Like if you don't allow yourself time to like deal with them and process them and like be with them and feel them, then you might allow them to pop out in other ways. Um, it's interesting because I, I remember when I was in an undergrad course, I think it was motivation. Uh, this was around the same time that I was reading Language Signs and Calming Signals of Horses Recognition and Application by Raquel Dreisma. Um, in that book, she talks about displacement behavior. So horses might do a behavior that isn't like super necessary. You know, they might, if they're nervous, they might graze really quickly or they might scratch their eye on their leg or their leg with their lip or something that they, you know, there might not actually be an itch, but it's more of a like I'm nervous behavior. She compared it in the book to perhaps like if you are at a bus station and you're just sitting there waiting on your bus and then some, you know, sketchy character comes walking up to you, you might check the bus schedule. You might read the times that the bus is going to come, even though you know, but it's, it's a behavior that you're doing to be like, I'm not a threat. Please don't acknowledge me. (laughs) Don't see me. Um, you know, so I think that, um, in that the motivation course that I took was a little bit confusing because my professor explained to me displacement behaviors in humans are when you displace, say, your anger. Um, And I don't know if that's just different people using the same term in different circumstances, but um, displaced emotion or projected emotion, per se, um, projected is more, at least from my understanding, that like if you're angry, you're like, and you're talking to somebody and you start interpreting them as being angry, then you're like, hey, you're being angry. And they're like, no, dude, that's you. Um, that's more of how I, I think of projection, but displacement is more when you say, uh, this is how my professor explained it. He was like, you've had a long day at work and you know, your boss was really hard on you and you come home and you take it out on your family instead of taking it out on your boss, because there's no avenue for you to let that emotion out. So instead of taking it out on somebody that you can't, your boss, then you take it out on your you know, your family where you can, where it's a little bit safer to express that emotion. Um, 
regardless, both of those avenues are what I might consider to be unhealthy and not particularly helpful. They might make you feel better for a little bit, but they're not going to address the underlying issues and whatnot. So as I was saying, what the problem can come up is you're denying yourself that experience and that opportunity for some self-care, but also you might be setting yourself up for not only feeling guilty and shameful that you weren't able to leave that stuff at the barn door, but also that you might end up taking it out on your horse in one way or another. So for instance, this happened to me a couple of days ago. Um, I was working with six and um, on the trailer loading from a couple episodes ago, and it was going really well and he was doing so great. And I was like really hyped about training. And so I was like, finally, I'm really feeling motivated. You know what? I'm going to go work with Azula. And I haven't been working with her Um, I've been super, super inconsistent with that. And I have felt really guilty and like a lot of like, oh God, I just bought her. And uh, for what? Like, I'm not doing anything with her. And I, uh, and upon thinking about that, I'm like, where is this obligation coming from? You know, obviously they're, they're the basic things she needs to know, but for all intents and purposes, she kind of knows everything that she needs to know right now anyway. So You know, there's not a whole lot of training to be done with a two-year-old. Yes, it would be great if she was basically a full-grown adult horse as far as skills and stuff go. Um, But in reality, she doesn't really mind and it doesn't particularly affect her if I'm not like really, really ahead of the game in terms of her education. So at least it doesn't impact her negatively. It would always benefit, but um, at least the way that I would plan to go about it, I should hope it would always benefit. Um, but my point is I've, I've felt that and, you know, I, I had had this great training session with six and I was like, you know what, I'm going to go get Azula and I'm going to work with her and it's going to be great. And I was really optimistic about it, but I was, I still had those like, doubts and that obligation and the shame and guilt around it. So that was going on in the background. And my response to that was, that doesn't matter. You're just, you know, in your head, you're talking yourself down. You know what you can do. And you know, this horse, you're capable. You got it. What are you worried about? And um, so that is more of the, you know, boxing it up and putting it away sort of method rather than dealing with it and actually thinking about that and like I don't know how else to say other than processing it and sitting with it and working through it and the only way out is through you can't go around you can't shove it aside it just will keep popping up in other ways so um you know I got her into the little training area and I started working with her and (laughs) Azula is the most magical, wonderful creature on planet Earth. And as a result, she is very, very enthusiastic about training and is like so gung-ho that it's a little bit overwhelming at times. And uh, I was not there (laughs) because I had just been working with Six, who is very thoughtful and slow and careful and what I think most people like in the horse world would deem respectful like he is afraid to put a foot out of place and so with Azula she's just like wow here I am I'm gonna do this and uh just like what are we doing where are we going what do I need to do and just like way too much and so I hadn't really shifted into Azula gear per se and so I I got really overwhelmed and I wasn't like super on it And I kept changing my criteria and I was like, oh my God, this is a mess. I can't do this. And so I just ended up giving her treats like, you know, in a pile, my end of session cue, not just like feeding her treats. Um, And I was like that this was just a mess. That was was not I wasn't set up well enough because the the area where I have to work with them is like not the area. It's, It's like a little round pen where we shut Zoe and her mom in to eat to keep them separate from the baby since they eat different food and then we let them back out right after they eat but um that has been my like little training area and it just doesn't work because it's such a pain to get um to try and get one horse in there because Zoe and Amber Zoe's mom think that they're supposed to go in there whenever the gate opens and Zoe is very protective over me she resource guards like 
I want to train. I want the snacks when I have them. And so um, she's also like, this is my area. And she'll tell the babies to kindly exit stage right, left. I wasn't a theater kid. But um, yeah, so it, it's it's just very stressful to begin with. And then Azula gets kind of worked up because she's like, how do I sneak in there with past Zoe? And so it, it's just a lot. It's not great. But good news is we just got the lumber in to start fencing the outdoor arena. So I'll be able to start training out there, which I am so excited about. And it'll be great for Azula because I'll be able to lead her away and bring her back and all of that good stuff. Um, so yeah, it's it was just chaos. And so I, I made her the end of session cue pile and I was like, all right, this is that was it for today. We're going to go reflect now. And so um, I didn't, <laughs> is the honest truth. And uh, so I'll do it with you on this podcast. How about that? So, um, you know, all of those doubts and fears and concerns and worries and obligations and guilt and shame, like we're in the background. And then this, like I had this ray of optimism because training with six was going so well that I was like, I can do this. I'm going to go do it. But it wasn't, it didn't come from like a true belief in myself, I guess, which sounds corny, but like I didn't actually have that foundation to start on. I was starting on a foundation of, I don't actually think I can do this, but maybe today I'll prove myself wrong. And uh, a lot of times for me, honestly, that works. <laughs> like, and, and so it's kind of a self-defeating cycle because I, I get this little burst of confidence and then I do well and I'm like, oh wait, yeah, I am good. But I'm using external validation and feedback rather than like actually building myself up from the inside. And so when you're reliant on the outside world responding how you thought or you wanted it to, you're, you're getting your self-worth and your validation or your skill level assessed from other things and other people, other animals, what have you. So it's not coming from a place of like, yeah, I'm actually genuinely confident in my ability as a trainer. It's like, oh, well, if this training session doesn't go well, then I'm a terrible trainer. Um, why am I? <laughs> I'm not even a trainer. And then it's just like, you know, you, you get a little bit up in terms of like, I, f I feel like I've got this. And then you just come crashing back down even further than where you started. So in my opinion, the best way, as I said, to actually like come at training from a good place and well, not good as a value label, but like a, a place that is sustainable is to come at it from a perspective of the whole picture. You know, what have you done in training? What, how have you been able to overcome issues in the past? How have you worked through problems that you maybe didn't think that you were super capable of working through? And does, does your track record demonstrate that you are a good trainer or a bad trainer? And yes, there will be some level of, you know, external validation in that. But I think using the whole picture rather than, you know, just niche little case studies is a a bit of a bigger way of looking at it to get you started on the path for, uh, of changing that validation system from external to internal to where you can come at it from. I not so much as like I'm talented and I'm skilled, but I know that I will always do what is best for the horse. And I think in that training session, I made the best call. I did because I couldn't I, I physically was not in a headspace where I could make good training judgment and good calls. And like I was working on something very simple and I, I was just getting over overblown <laughs> and an all term and all what is that expression? And for all intents and purposes, I was um I was a very, very good trainer working with six, and then I was a very, very bad trainer working with Azula. But that's that's not where I want to be drawing my self-worth and my, you know, opinion of my own skill is from depending on how the most recent training session went, where I should be, should is a dangerous word, but um, where I would like to be drawing that self-worth value, whatnot from is from a place of like, 
genuine belief in myself and my horses and my dedication and my passion and in my connection to the horses and like knowing that I, I, I have done the research I have studied and I know what I'm looking for. And some days I might get it wrong and some days I might not. And some days I might do really well. And some days just don't go according to plan and that's okay. And being genuinely okay with that and not having it be a reflection of how good of a trainer I am or how poor of a trainer I am. So what can you do to make this better? Um, and you know, I guess I'm kind of playing therapist and client in this little session here with myself of how, how can I come at training from a better place? Can I get my, my self-esteem and my confidence as a trainer or as a rider or as an owner or as a horse caretaker, whatever, whatever you are to horses, how can you get that, get that level up of belief in yourself? And so, Hmm. Some ideas and some things that I've probably, I can't remember if I've said it before on the podcast or not, but um, one of the things that I've talked about before is that when you go into a training session, it's, it's important to, a cliche phrase, if you will, focus on the positive, but not in the way that you know people think that like, oh yeah, everything's going to be great and happy. No, I'm talking about like, well, yes, okay, that could be helpful. But uh, I think that it should be supplemented with actionable behavior steps. What can what can I do and some amount of visualizing. So um, this is something this is another one of my background projects that I'm working on. Um, And I hope I hope I can get it done this summer or sooner. That would be great. is to develop a training journal that you can use on your phone or uh, print out whatnot or, you know, whatever, but, um, and have a, a space for visualizing. Yes, it's great to have training plans and shaping plans and things of that nature, but also, you know, maybe just like a little area to write out what you see happening because Like, I'm one of those people, and I know I discussed it in the last episode, that journaling is so powerful. It's amazing. It's really hard for me to do sometimes because I'm like, yeah, I know. I got it. It's in my head. Why do I need to write it down? But I think why writing it down is so powerful is because, A, it helps cement it in your memory better. That is a proven proven phenomenon that we are aware of in the science. Um, But also, (laughs) pardon my cat, just crab walking because he doesn't want to move um but the other element of that is it makes you think about it more and so when you when you just are like okay let me sit down and visualize my training okay I want what do I what am I working on I'm working on getting my horse to walk over a pole maybe your horse has a, a fear of walking over poles okay so um he's going to do it really well. It's going to go great. I'm going to use targeting and I'm going to click him. I'd like to keep the session around like maybe 20 minutes. Okay. I'm going to go train. Uh, that doesn't work. (laughs) That doesn't like take you through the training. And I'm not saying that you have to sit there for the duration of how long you think you'll be training so much as it is like walk yourself through the steps instead of using things like it's going to go well, it's going to go bad, it's going to, what if this happens? What if that happens? What would you like to see happen? So if if we're taking that simple walk over a pole example, okay, so your horse has a fear of the pole and you need him to walk over it because you, you know maybe you want to do some trot poles at some point. And the horse is afraid of the pole, doesn't want to go anywhere near it. Okay, so what would the first step be? Um, For me, depending on the horse, of course, but like in this hypothetical scenario, my first step would be, can the horse look at the pole? It doesn't have to be anywhere near the pole. We could be 20 meters away from the pole, but can you look at it? And okay, so after that, what would I do? How would that feel? Would I be comfortable if that was as far as we got in the training session or would that upset me if I didn't get further than that? And then moving from there, visualizing, assuming that the horse is able to look at the pole, can we take a step you know, forward the same distance? Like if, if the pole's at the center of a circle can, and we're at a 20 meter distance from it on a big 40 meter circle, can we 
Can we walk around the pole at 40 meters maybe? And then can we slowly, like, can I ask the horse to turn his head inside the circle and look at it? Can the horse face it? Can we maybe take a sidestep? Can we walk towards it a little bit? Can we do this, that, you know, different different things and evaluating like how would it feel if the session ended there? How would it feel if the session progressed? Where where are you comfortable ending it? Um, Things like that and just kind of taking yourself through it and actually visualizing yourself doing it and not just being like, yeah, it's going to go good or it's going to go bad and I'm optimistic now. Um, So, you know, just being a little bit more actionable about it and um evaluating your emotional state your mental state um where would you like your body to be how are you going to react if x y and z happens um do you have a plan for if you get further than you expect it to go or would you end if your horse you know suddenly he's walking over the pole oh my god now what um so what what do you do do you drill the pole do you go do you take the criteria step back do you make sure he's comfortable before you know things like that um so that that's one element of it is visualizing what you want to see happen and being able to go from there. Because I think what happens a lot of times, and this is the other element that I was, <laughs> so I started that train of thought on, was that when, when we're working with issues in horse training or that our horse has this behavior that we don't like or we're trying to get rid of, you know, I hear so many people say things like, oh, yeah, I'm really excited to go to the show, but, you know, my horse has this trailering issue and it's going to be an hour to get him on the trailer. Or, you know, I, I'm really excited to go work with my horse, but when I get on him, he really locks his jaw to the right and it's just, it's going to be bad. And um, so the example that I use is in talking about um, well, let's, let's stick with the pole example. Okay. For simplicity's sake. So I think what happens a lot of times, and I think this may be more unconscious than actually like we're aware and we're actively trying to do this. I think it's just kind of when you let the fear, you know, take, um, take the forefront of your mind and the fear becomes your focal point. Your you start thinking with this pole example, Oh, I really need to work with, you know, let's call him Brownie on walking over the poles. And um, Brownie just is really afraid of the poles. And uh, I just, it's going to be so long. He's not going to want to look at it. He's not going to want to go over it. He's going to fight me. Um, you know, maybe in a more traditional setting, you might be like, and then I'm going to have to kick him and that doesn't feel good. And we're just going to get into a fight. It goes this way every time. I'm so frustrated. Um, you know, or he's going to spook at the barrel at the end of the arena. My trainer's probably going to wear that hat that he's afraid of. Um, you know, what if this, what if that? And, and so when you focus your energy on everything that can go wrong in that way, then that's kind of what you're asking for to some degree. And I'm not saying that like, you know, if things go wrong, you were asking for it, but that's where you're dedicating your energy. And as a trainer and as somebody that is very much meticulous, methodical and plans for worst case scenario, um, it's funny because my mom and I have this joke with my dad that he is the worry ward. He is going to come up with the worst case scenario every time. And people actually call my dad and they're like, okay, so I'm thinking about doing this thing. Please, Mark, tell me what the worst case scenarios are because I'm worried I've missed something. And I I have really taken on that trait. And it's, it's a blessing and a curse <laughs> because it's great for being able to, you know, have some management going on. And you're like, oh, nope, we can't do that because of X, Y, and Z. And you can avoid a lot of, um, you know, potentially bad situations with that. Uh, but at the same time, it kind of sets me up to think worst case scenario and then inadvertently take myself down that path. So it's it's almost like, you know, I, I know that a lot of people have had this experience and maybe you haven't, maybe you have, but when you're riding your horse, you're like, oh my God, don't spook, don't spook, don't spook, don't spook. Oh, and he spooked. Um, so instead of freezing up and being like, you know, you're on a trail ride and you're like, please don't spook, please don't spook, please don't spook. Okay. What can you do? Uh, don't don't spook is not a behavior walk calmly past the thing that I'm concerned that you're going to spook about 
is a behavior. What do you want the horse to do? Um, so when your horse is, you know, maybe about to spook, okay, what can you do? From a traditional standpoint, you can try to redirect your horse's attention back to you. You can back away from the thing that you're, you're concerned your horse is going to spook at and give him more time to think, more space, distance to process, to relax. You could get off and walk your horse over by it slowly. You can put yourself between the horse and the scary object. You can, you know, create distance that way, make him feel a little bit more safe. Um, and you, you can, there's a lot you can do. However, just going, don't spook, don't spook, don't spook isn't helpful (laughs) because also that's increasing your anxiety and that is transferring to your horse to some degree. I feel like we're the, you know, an avatar, the blue people, not last airbender, um, where they connect their braids to their horses. I feel like we have a little bit of that going on without the braid situation. And so, I think that energy is somewhat transferable and your horses can pick up on that. And as a herd creature, they're, you know, they depend on the sensations of others to, you know, assess whether a situation is safe or not. So it's, it's important that you are able to work towards having a more level head. I know when I first started showing and competing, I used to like completely blackout in my dressage and stadium rounds like not in the sense that I would pass out but that I would come out of the ring and my trainer would be like why did you do that why did that happen and I'd be like I have no idea what you're talking about (laughs) and she'd be like what and I feel like I don't remember it I have zero recollection of that round and because my anxiety was so bad I was just surviving at that point thankfully I have a decent enough internal compass that I guess I was just able to to know where I was supposed to go and how, you know, at what gate I was supposed to do that. But I, I couldn't remember my rounds. And so I, I, I had a friend that I was riding with that took beta blockers and I, I was like 14 at the time. I had no idea what that was. And so I was like, all right, let me ask my doctor for that. Cause she had really bad anxiety too. And she was like, it really helped me. So I asked, I talked to my doctor about it and my doctor gave me a prescription and so I, I took it and then I went into dressage and it was crazy because for the first time I was able to like, I, I could still feel the mental anxiety, but not the physiological, like my heart rate rising, my body, like getting, you know, cotton mouth and tense and none of that happened. It was just in my head. And then after my body was able to like be out of the way, so to speak, then I could start working on my mind. And I didn't realize what I was doing at the time. And I'm not recommending that if you have anxiety uh, about showing or anything that you should take a beta blocker, that might be something that you want to look into. But I am not a medical professional and am not qualified whatsoever to advise you on that. So just disclaimer. But um, that's what I did for better or for worse. Uh, I actually have no idea how those affect health or anything like that. I was a child and I trusted my doctor. So um, anyway, I was able then to work through what was going on with me mentally to the point where I backed off needing the beta blockers and I stopped taking them and then I could just go into dressage and yes, I would still like my heart rate would start to rise, but I had learned at that point how to control my mind a little bit better so that I could go in and stay focused even though my body was sort of betraying me in a way thinking that we're in a life and death situation. Um, and that has really bled over into my career working with younger horses and horses that have more fear-based issues. I, I've really developed an ability to stay calm mentally and like keep my head in situations that I would otherwise usually be very stressed out in because I, and it's funny because me and my boss have this dynamic, like to a T, she gets very nervous and freaked out. And I end up being the very level headed. We got this. You just, you go, go over there. I got it. I'll take care of it. But you know, in, in other circumstances, you know, maybe outside of horses, I end up being the one that's like way freaked out. And, you know, maybe my boyfriend who's very calm and relaxed and he doesn't get stressed and he's the level headed one. It seems like we kind of, use those system dynamics based on the situation. It's like, well, it's do or die. One of us has to be, has to be the calm, cool and collected one. So, um, yeah, it's just a process of learning yourself. And I think that the key to all of it really is having that awareness, like being present 
and noticing that you're getting stressed and in the beginning stages, you know, I wouldn't recommend, you know, the first time practicing this be when you're going to do the thing that stresses you out a lot, like, you know, going in for a dressage test at a horse show. You know, maybe you need to just start thinking about the dressage test in your mind. And if it gives you anxiety or starts stressing you out at all, you know, just sit with it a little bit and and just feel that feeling and get a little bit more comfortable with it. And then maybe go further in your dressage test or maybe you quit for the day. And then maybe the next day you start visualizing again. And when you get a little bit anxious, notice it, sit with it, be with it, you know, slow, regulate your breathing, self-soothe, you know, we're good. I'm not in any danger. It's a dressage test. I got this. None of that negative self-talk. Like it's just a dressage test. You're just thinking about it. It's not that bad. Um, but you know, actually like reassuring yourself that you're okay. Don't add other negative emotions, guilt, shame, um, sit with it and be like, okay, I got this. Let me just, let me be find find where I'm okay, where I'm comfortable thinking about it. And then after, or if you are already comfortable thinking about it, or after you get to that point, sorry, um, then you can start progressing to maybe, you know, being on your horse and just maybe walk your dressage test, walk the pattern. Don't do the gate changes or anything like that. And, and just be comfortable following the pattern. And then maybe you can trot it and then maybe you can canter it. And then maybe you can do the actual test all the while, you know, reassuring yourself it's okay. And I think that the biggest thing is, especially in competition is the pressure we put on ourselves that there's so much weight and value tied to who we are and how we feel about ourselves in like these tangible certifiable ways. Like, you know, if I, if I get a bad score on my dressage test, then I'm not a good rider. And that's not true. It's entirely subjective. Number one, dressage tests. Um, but in addition to that, it, it has no bearing on how good of a rider you are. You know, if you're struggling with it, you're working through something and that's okay. You are allowed to get better and you're allowed to be not the best at it at the moment. And you can work on it. And I think that that is a big issue that I've had with things like coming back to the Azula training is that like, okay, I made a name for myself being a positive reinforcement trainer um, somewhat, which is a funny thing to say now because the YouTube views and the Instagram views are not so good. But, you know, I, I became somebody that is known as a trainer. And then when I'm not able to do what I had hoped to do, Um, what I had spent about five minutes planning, if that, um, and and it didn't go well. Well, of course it didn't. And also that's fine. It doesn't matter. You know, I mean, it's not a life and death situation working in that circumstance. I was not in any danger. I wasn't putting my horse in any danger and it's just fine. You know, it doesn't matter if you, do super well and it has no bearing on who you are, how good of a rider or trainer or horse person you are. You are allowed to be in a place that is not perfect. And like I said, that's something that I've really, really struggled with lately. And especially in working with horses, I'm a trainer now. I have to, you know, I have to be doing these miracles. I need to be Amy from Heartland, basically, that I just go out there and the horse is fixed. I've magically decided that he's, oh, he's bucking because he wants to be a bronc. And now he's happy. <laughs> Questionable decision making there, Amy. Um, but yeah, so I mean, it's, it's, this is the real world. It is not Hollywood. And I think that you are much better set up to Well, okay, let me rephrase. If your goal is to enjoy horses and to be happy working with them and being with your horse and learning from them and growing throughout this process, if that sounds good to you, then doing the whole guilt, shame, value placement on yourself, am I good? If I screw up on a ride, then I'm a worthless rider. That is not going to help reach that goal. It's not even going to help you reach the goal of actually wanting to be that um, critically acclaimed rider, you know, it's, it's not going to lead you to those, those places of being a, you know, a mentally tough competitor or whatnot. What will is assessing, okay, something has gone wrong. Let me reflect on it without any of that, like 
personalizing it, you know, you're allowed to look at it for what it is. And this is where the external examination is very helpful because you can look and you can be like, okay, well, a lot of that wasn't going super well because it was really windy that day and I'm working with a very young horse and all the other horses were trying to rush the gate and I got flustered. I'd started out working with a very calm horse and then switched to a very not calm horse. And, you know, there was so much working against me and I didn't really prepare myself. And uh, one of my favorite quotes that Warwick always says is the, um, I think it's the Navy SEALs, like their little mantra or whatever. You don't rise to uh, the occasion, you fall to the level of preparation. I didn't prepare for that at all. All I was relying on was my prior skill, not in how am I prepping for this actual situation here. And so without that preparation, I set myself up for failure. I set my horse up for failure. And that's fine. I learned from that. So I can look at that and I can go, these are the things that went wrong. These are the things that for future reference, I need to address and make sure that I prevent antecedent arrangement, behavior nerds, you know what I'm talking about, set it up to where it will go well, or at least it's, it's set up to the best of your ability to go well. And past that, it's kind of up to a lot of different variables. It still might not go super well, and that's okay. Then you, you assess again, and you eliminate, you add, you alternate, no, alter, that's the word, um, and adjust what needs to be adjusted, and then try again. And, um, and detaching yourself from those external things and looking at them objectively as they are. And then once you've come to the conclusion of what went wrong, what you can do better, you know, or differently next time, it might not even prove to be better, but at least, you know, you're changing something. Doing the same thing over and over again usually does not produce different results. Sometimes it does, but only if other things are changing. You know, maybe it's rainy one day, maybe it's sunny one day, but I'm doing the same thing. Well, the weather's changing. You have to account for that and cut yourself some slack. Jesus, this is supposed to be fun. And so, you know, having having those things set out in front of you, being able to evaluate it and then taking a step back and going, okay, how did that feel for me? Working with six felt really great. Why did it feel super great? Because I, I knew what I was doing. I was very confident in it and he was making progress and he seemed comfortable and he was making progress. Why did Azula feel so bad? Well, it was really disorganized and it was stressful and I didn't really prepare for that. And so next time I need to prepare for that. But also I'm feeling really guilty that I didn't prepare for that. I'm feeling guilty that or shameful that I wasn't able to have a successful training uh, session because I'm a trainer and I should be good at training. Why should I be good at training? Because I'm a trainer. Do trainers have to be perfect all of the time? And so this is the process of, you know, analyzing some of those underlying automatic thoughts. So my automatic thought when I have a bad training session is, well, I'm supposed to be a trainer and I've had a bad session. The automatic thought there is that if I'm a trainer, I should have only good sessions. And that doesn't make sense logically, but it's it's one of those shortcuts mentally that I have that I have to unlearn and replace. So what can I replace that with? Trainers are allowed to make mistakes and trainers are allowed to learn from their mistakes and do things differently next time. And if it doesn't go better, you're learning all the time and you're only becoming better for it because for every mistake you make, you've learned something. And it's only a mistake if you don't learn from it. (laughs) That is something I say all the time. And so, you know, for me with Azula, that session was not a mistake. I learned that I seriously need to take some time and I have known this for a while and I fight doing it because I, when I get inspired, I'm worried that it's going to, you know, disappear. So I'm like, oh, I want to train. I need to go do it. And so, um, (laughs) that's life with ADHD, follow the dopamine. And so with, with, with all of this, my point is that, you, you can separate yourself from what's going on. You can use the environment and the events that happen to gauge your direction. But as far as your motivation, your purpose, your passion, that has to come from inside. And if it's not, 
that's something you need to sit and think about a little bit and evaluate. Is this actually something I want to do? Am I doing it out of obligation? Am I am I setting too high of standards on myself? What what advice would I give to somebody else in this circumstance? You know, that might help you detach from it a little bit. But I want to be careful that when I'm saying detach yourself from it a little bit, I'm not saying to ignore your emotions and leave yourself at the car and or at the barn door and proceed without yourself. You you are the most important part of your um, your training and your relationship with your horse doesn't work without you. So you have to bring that part of yourself and you have to be okay with bringing that part of yourself. And if you're constantly thinking, I'm a bad trainer, I shouldn't be here, I have imposter syndrome, you know, I'm not, I'm not equipped for this, I'm not good enough for this. Okay, why? Why are you not good enough? Why are you not equipped? Have you not done enough research? Is there something you can do about that? Can you do more research? Do you, how, do you feel like you've done a sufficient amount? Then why aren't you equipped? Because you don't have the experience? Well, how are you going to get the experience? Give it a shot. Set up a situation that is safe and that feels comfortable for you and start with baby steps and make slow progress, giving yourself enough space to grow and learn and develop that confidence and allow that confidence to come from you knowing that you're going to do what is best for your horse. You're going to make decisions that keep you both safe and keep you both enjoying and learning and just having a good time. And if it doesn't go well, that's okay. It's so difficult and I keep repeating it because it is so hard and that's not something that the horse world really propagates. If you don't have the blue ribbon, you lost. And I I can't, like, I think one time when I was with Zoe, one of the happiest times of my, my riding career was getting third on Zoe. I finally placed, I started out in the bottom of the class in eighth place and that third place ribbon to me felt like first place. And then when I posted it, um, you know, I, I really, really had to try to keep perspective because there was a large part of me that was just hearing this comment that I got years ago. Um, I can't even remember what platform it was on, but somebody said something to the effect of like, why do people follow her and like enjoy her content? She's never even won an event before, which is untrue now, but at the time that was true. Um, I have won one whole event in my life, uh, so... Sorry, I don't have the fanciest warm bloods on the market. Those are the ones that win everything because they they know what to do and they're a little bit more talented than, you know, the backyard thoroughbred uh, with a child, a teenager <laughs> training and riding it. Um, so, you know, it is what it is. But I wasn't super able to give myself that grace. I do remember a lot of it coming from like, well, I don't have the fanciest horse out here. I can't afford the fanciest horse and just putting the blame on others and like making it okay for me because other people were, you know, cheating per se. They're not. They just have a different set of circumstances and I should be competing against myself. It's not like eventing makes a ton of money anyway, even at the top of the sport. Um, so, and at the, at the local stuff, you know, all the shows I went to never made a dime. There is no profit. I think I won a saddle pad and, uh, I, Oh, it was a saddle pad, uh, like a cup, like a whiskey cup and, uh, a stall plate of the farm. So, you know, it, like it, it just, <laughs> the idea that, you know, you need to be winning and like, maybe if you're trying to be a professional, that makes sense. But at the same time, you can still be a professional without winning everything. You can like, do, what what is winning to you? Is it getting that blue ribbon by any means necessary? Or is it being the kindest, most, you know, compassionate rider for your horse and being guiding to them, being a secure presence, a, a rider that's confident and will help them, um, you know, and if you get the blue ribbon, amazing. You know, what? what is the priority here? And you can want both at the same time. I'm not saying you can't. But I, I think that there's a lot of that, that value on the other stuff to add value here on the internal stuff. And it's, it's really important to me because of the things that I've learned and the things that I've been through, experienced, and learned from all of my mental anguish in this sport is that it really has to come from you and giving yourself, I, I don't like saying grace for some reason. That sounds like I'm a Southern lady, like bless your heart. Um, <laughs> like giving yourself 
room to mess up and to learn from that and to grow. I mean, that sounds like a much more reasonable expectation than being perfect and excelling all of the time. Because by default, if you don't, then you failed. So if your goal is to learn from your mistakes and, you know, try not to make the same ones again, and if you mess up again, learn from it, try not to do it again, and try to plan for something better to happen and visualize what it would be like for something better to happen rather than obsessing over all of the things that could go wrong. I know a big part of my writing career was constantly worrying about like, oh, you know, I'm worried about this jump, you know, 7A on the course. What if I don't get in straight and then my horse runs out and then I end up in the ditch for 7B and then she jumps 7C alone or, you know, whatever, things like that. What if it went well? What am I going to do if it goes well? Because all I've planned for is it to go wrong. That's what I've given energy to. That's where I've focused my mind. It's the pink elephant in the room. You can you can't move away from things. You can only move towards. So what are you trying to move towards in your training? Are you trying to move towards, you know, being happy with your horse? <laughs> I mean, I think that's something that gets missed a lot in talks of training and working with horses and things like that because it's, it's all this technical how can I get horse to do x y and z how can I do x y and z but like what why are you doing this D- does it matter to you that you're doing it for a reason um and what is that reason how can you use that reason as a jumping off point to get to where you want to be in your training with horses and how can you make it something that you enjoy how can you move in that direction. If you're focusing all of your energy on what could go wrong, then you're moving towards that. And it's going to be very stressful and it's not going to be a particularly enjoyable experience. So if you if you want to move towards your goals and your dreams and your hopes and that feeling that you want from working with your horse, just dedicate a little bit more time to focusing on that. Of course, evaluate the things that could go wrong but but be aware of why you're evaluating those things. Are you evaluating what might happen if you do X, Y, and Z, and that could be bad or catastrophic because you're you're doing risk management and assessment and you're wanting to plan for the success and you just want to make sure that you get a lay of the land um, so that you can be you know prepared for whatever is to come and to hopefully set yourself up for success. Or are you are you seeing all of those negative? things happening around you because you're afraid that that is what is going to happen and that you have no control over it whatsoever. Um, You know, that's the thing. And at the end of the day, we don't have control. What will be, will be. And that's okay too. And so just letting go of that, I need to control it so I can mitigate, you know, all of these negative emotions. You can't. The best you can do is to think about it, sit with it, and visualize it and make peace with it. And also add that element of reassuring yourself, grilling yourself on why, you know, like what I said with the trainer thing, you know, do all trainers actually have to be perfect all of the time in order to be good trainers? Or do they merely have to learn from their mistakes, from their horses, from outside education, and be constantly pushing towards this goal of helping horses, helping people, and you know, helping themselves and making riding enjoyable, helping their horses, you know. So so just that little evaluation, maybe it's an exercise you can do at some point. Um, and it, like I said, it's something that I do plan on coming out with at some point. Um, and I'll talk more about it when I do come out with it. <laughs> I, I know I'm going to. It's just a matter of executing it. But um, yeah, I think that's where I'm going to wrap up this episode. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Maybe it was thought-provoking. Maybe you learned something. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you're like, yes, this is what I've been needing. Maybe you're like, I already knew that. Whatever. Let me know in the comments below on YouTube. If you're watching it on YouTube, please do because I'm, I've been looking at you the whole time. If you're not looking back at me, that makes me very sad and please, please do it um, or else. Yeah, I don't have a follow-up. That is a bluff, but please don't call it, okay? (laughs) Uh, Anyway, so I think uh, my voice has about had it, so this is going to be one of the shorter Equithery episodes. But if you don't mind, please be sure to follow us on Instagram at Equithery. Uh, The website's equithery.com, and you can find me everywhere else at Jet Equithery. 
Um, and the last thing I'll say is Patreon. Support me on Patreon. I don't, I'm going to be real honest. I don't do a whole lot on there. But if you join the Patreon, you get access to an online community, a Discord server for Equithery members only, where you can talk about all things horsey on the server. We got lots of channels. It's great. And um, we also do live monthly meetings. And I just added merch to those tiers so you can get a little merch, merchy moo, um, because I don't have actual merch that you can purchase out yet. Um, but yeah, you can do that. We'll be having the live monthly meeting this week. I got to pick the date because, <laughs> oh my God, it's Monday and it's the end of the month. It's chaos, but we're going to do that. It's going to be a jolly old time. They normally run for like three hours of me talking and answering questions for like the first hour and a half. And then they usually devolve into just nonsense and us just talking. And it's awesome. I really enjoy them. And I think a lot of the members really enjoy them as well. So if you want to be a part of that, feel free to join. So it'll probably be on Thursday, I'm thinking. Maybe. I gotta check my calendar. But yeah, you got time to join because this should be up on Tuesday. And if it's on YouTube, it'll probably be up on Wednesday because my internet sucks. But with that, I'm going to go ahead and end this episode. Thank you guys endlessly for watching, listening, doing whatever. If you are listening on a podcast app, please be sure to subscribe or follow whatever the terminology is where you're listening and rate it. Spotify added a rating feature. So if you'd like to do that, please do it. It helps boost the podcast in one way or another. Not sure how that works, but analytics uh, and yeah, technology. So I'm going to go. Thank you guys so much for watching, listening. I already said that, but you know the drill. I repeat myself. That's this podcast, but you know what? You will hear it <laughs> one way or another. And I tend to like that format because I check out a lot when I'm listening. So with my podcast, you never have to worry about that because you'll probably catch it one of the three times that I say it. But yeah, I'll catch you guys in the next one. Bye. Bye.